Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone to our business services committee meeting. Uh, today is Wednesday, July 22nd, and it's currently 531 PM. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, we do have some citizen comments tonight. So I will go ahead and read um, the uh, preliminary for that. So the school code provides for a public comment period at each board meeting subject to reasonable constraints. The practice of this board is to limit public comment to three minutes per speaker to a total of 30 minutes at the beginning of the meeting. Speakers addressing the board are expected to maintain a reasonable level of civility. Also personnel matters are sensitive and confidential. Comments regarding individuals should be respectful. Insults and defamatory remarks have no place in this setting. The board will terminate public comment if speakers cannot adhere to these guidelines. And please identify yourself at the beginning of um, your remarks. And of course they are recorded because we're in a virtual meeting. So whenever you're ready, Mr. Smith. Okay, one moment, please. Hi, my name is Shannon Rowan. I have two students that go to St. Charles East High School. One will be a sophomore and one will be a junior. I was wondering if we could do something for the remote learning that would be similar to what some of the other school districts are doing where when you are at home remote, if you could zoom in to the actual live class, that way everyone's getting the same lecture and not missing out on anything and they're able to ask questions and everything in real time to actually engage them in their classes as opposed to sending them out on their own to watch material and record lectures. Thank you. Hello, my name is JC Hermanson and I'm a St. Charles resident and mom of an incoming first grader at Wild Rose Elementary. I, like many parents, are still struggling with which option to choose this upcoming school year 2021. I feel as if there are definite pros and cons to both in-person learning as well as e-learning and truly think parents and students will benefit to being able to utilize both learning structures. I'm contacting you today to ask what option, if any, there is for families who are wanting to send their children only a couple days a week, let's say two, days, two set days each week, and then do e-learning for the rest of the other three days. I think this option is great for families who are still hesitant to jump into large group settings and those who are wanting to minimize the amount of time young children are wearing a mask but still want their children to experience the in-person learning that they are used to. I believe this option is a great way to help support our students mentally and physically deal with the stress of these hard times while still receiving an education. I want to thank you for taking the time to acknowledge this, and I look forward to hearing what can be done in order to help those families like mine who would like an in-between instructional model option. Thank you again. Have a good day. That concludes citizen comment. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, and now we will move to Dr. Pearson uh, with the superintendent and, and uh, I'm assuming a COVID-19 update in there as well. Yes, good evening. Um, as you all know, we um, posted and shared our reopen schools guide yesterday uh, with the community that had our instructional models, information about health and safety in our schools, transportation, some greater detail for families and community members about our plans as we are working to reopen schools. Um, we continue to ask families to make a selection and choice um, as to whether they would like to engage in remote learning for the fall or choose an in-person option at either the elementary, middle, or high school. Um, to date, we have a little over 8,200 families that have made their selection, or 8,200 students who have made their selection. Um, we continue to have more and more families um, choose um, each day. Um, we would just like to remind everyone that Friday is the deadline for making your selection. Uh, we really need this, this information to begin to plan um, both our in-person sections as well as our remote learning sections to ensure that we have the appropriate instructional staff assigned to support student learning um, and to begin to plan our facilities to welcome students that are coming in person as well. So uh, we want to get that started as soon as possible. So if you have not had the opportunity to make your selection, uh, please uh, try to do so by Friday by the deadline. We, of course, will be reaching out beginning tomorrow to families that have not 
um, yet made a choice and uh, encouraged them, encouraging them uh, to do so. Um, so again, that's that's really important. We continue to plan each day um, for students coming back. We're acquiring the PPE that's necessary. We're working on um, ensuring that classrooms are set up with the appropriate social distancing. Um, we're getting new equipment that's necessary uh, for staff and students uh, to help with that. Um, and so um, I appreciate the work of the staff that are currently working in our schools uh, to prepare and those that will continue to come back and join us over the next couple of weeks um, as we try to make sure that we are able to open safely uh, for all of our students and staff. Uh, so that's um, all for the COVID updates tonight. We're going to talk about several COVID items on the agenda uh, that we need to purchase uh, and also as part of the budget. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. Uh, before we move into the discussion, I did want to um, communicate to the group, uh, Ms. Weibel in particular, as the um, additional chair for the Business Services Committee, she was on or is unable to attend tonight due to health reasons. So I just wanted to make everyone aware of that and also uh, the community that's listening as well. Um, and so with that, our first item for discussion is our Mid-Valley June 30th financial report. And I think Ms. Mayer, you're going to go ahead and do that. Yes. Um, okay. Mid-Valley is reporting that overall their revenue is slightly ahead of the prior year and um, expenses are lower than last year, which means that they are on track to end the year under budget. Um, I do also want to report, uh, point out that the report reflects near final numbers, meaning that they've included their um, payroll accrual for July and August in these numbers. So the only adjustments that will come will be some, possibly some more payables through July and August, and of course year-end audit adjustments. Okay, any questions or comments related to that item? Okay, our next item uh, is related to D303 and our June 30th, uh, 2020 financial report. And again, go ahead, please, Ms. Mayer. Alrighty, um, revenue continues to trend ahead of the prior year. Uh, you, you will notice the district continues to receive the regular um, evidence-based funding payments, and the district also received the third categorical payment for the 1920 school year on June 10th. Um, please also note that currently the state owes the district about 1.3 million, um, and that's with no vouchers being more than 30 days outstanding. So um, they are um, current right now. Our expenditures are trending very close to the prior year with no areas of concern at this time. Um, and again, please note for our report that this is a cash report through June, June 30th. We will continue to update the fiscal year end report as we go through July and August for our accrual period and um, the annual audit then is scheduled for September. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Any questions related to that? Okay. Okay, next item then, I think um, Dr. Dr. Chapman, you'll be speaking to this, the COVID-19 financial impact summary. Yes, thank you, Ms. Fairgrave. Um, in your packet, uh, there's a memo and also on page 11 of your packet is a, a breakdown of expenses incurred uh, through July 13th. Um, I did my best to categorize these. Uh, each of the bands, um, I don't know if it came through uh, on the scan copy this way, but are colored to try to help indicate um, where there's heading breaks. So I'll just really quickly orient you with the chart and see what questions you might have. But um, we've, we've classified these into health monitoring and disinfecting protocols. Um, things in that category would be um, going to touchless faucets and toilets, um, bottle fillers, hand sanitizer, signage, air purifiers, things of that nature. In that category, uh, we've spent to date, uh, just over a half a million dollars, 526,000. Um, on the far right, you'll notice uh, there's a column for CARES funded. So those are CARES Act expenses um, that will be generating offsetting revenue as well, um, all of which would, which would be F FY21 revenue received. Uh, the next category is personal protective equipment or PPE, um, shields and face masks, uh, gloves, gowns, things of those natures. Um, Next would be technology systems and licenses. This would be Mr. Smith, uh, Mr. Shazar's uh, um, 
wide items for the most part, um, in which they uh, uh, found necessary to uh, invest in systems. You've seen these come through business services over the last couple months uh, to help with uh, remote learning um, or devices. And then la uh, the next category is uh, staffing, any changes to staffing that's kind of self-explanatory. And then lastly, uh, transportation related expenses uh, as well. So each of those categories has their own subtotals. Um, if we look in the FY20, uh, what we spent on the expense side, it was um, a total of, uh, oh, excuse me, I lost my place here. Um, FY20 and 21 combined, excuse me, was $1.4 million. And then I also have in the revenue side um, offset. And so we actually lost money in student fees. Uh, so fees are revenue for us. Um, we had to re refund in FY20 around $220,000. And then you can see the CARES Act funding on the federal side, providing additional revenue uh, that we expect to get through FY21. So um, the net total, uh, and again, the assumption here is that we're going to spend all that CARES Act funding on the offsetting expenses, uh, which we will eventually receive that revenue for is uh, just over a million dollars to date. So I'm sorry, just to clarify that last point. So we have not received any of the uh, reimbursement or funding from the CARES Act. Yeah, that's that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Yep. Yeah, the grant it's been approved and those items are approved uh, to receive the reimbursement, but it has not actually been received. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions related to this detail? I, I think you did a nice job here, Dr. Chapman. Um, are there any areas that kind of surprised you or are sending up some red flags or orange flags that you want to keep an eye on and, or were, une I mean, so much of it was unexpected. Um, but I do like how you divided it and, and have organized it so we can see what came out of this year's budget versus next year's as well. But are there any things that you are, you've got concerns about? Um, well, first, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, glad to, glad that it's helpful. And in terms of the um, surprises, I wouldn't say surprises. I, I, I know we spent a lot of time in that, you know, health monitoring PPE PP, PP area. So it doesn't surprise me that, you know, there's a lot of expense there. Um, I think we're going to continue to monitoring, you know, the staffing one on both sides is going to be very interesting is we have a lot of additional supplementary pay as we learned at the end of fiscal year 20 that doesn't necessarily happen. So, you know, field trips and extra bus routes that don't happen that end up saving funds. Um, you know, what will happen with substitute costs, for example, in the coming year, will we see a, a rise in those costs? So I would say if there's one thing that we're really keeping our eye on, it's, it's the staffing area. So, oh, go ahead, Mr. McNally. Just a quick question. Um, as far as this, the payments that the, you said the state is not, uh, they're, they're up to date, um, given the kind of the uncertainty that's that's going on right now. Is there any concern that we're going to get that money? Or I, I think you had mentioned before that it's, we are likely to get it. Um, but I just wanted to know if there's any, any additional concern on that. Um, so I, I think probably the, the area from state funding that's always the biggest concern is our categorical payments. Um, as Ms. Mader said, they, they are caught up uh, to date um, with, with their payments. That's, that's an area that it wouldn't surprise me if, if we see delays coming into next year. And that's part of the budget assumption that we'll talk about during the budget presentation as well. But other than that, no. I mean, I think evidence-based funding is clearly a priority for them. Um, and, and we've continued to see those on time. And so I think I feel good about where we're at right now, considering especially where the state's at. Right. Thank you. Welcome. Um, Dr. Chapman, in, in the staffing section, I wanted to um, touch base related to the additional teachers for fiscal year 21. Are those the same as the Empower teachers or is this incremental to that? Thank you. I, I'm sorry, I should have pointed that out. In the, in the budget presentation, we'll cover this as well. Um, this is directly related to um, the staffing plan necessary for the elementary um, in-person learning that, that we're going to need to staff. And of course, as you're aware, you know, with social distancing requirements, uh, that will necessitate uh, smaller class sizes. So 
those FTE are directly related to that. Okay. Uh, and then I was also curious about the reduction of enrollment aids and what that. Yeah, and that's kind of the, the flip side of, of that same uh, discussion with lower class sizes. Um, we typically budget money um, on an annual basis for those kind of unusual circumstances where we get class sizes that rise higher than our typical average when we get into the 26 or 27. Okay. And we add, we add an enrollment aid to support the learning in that classroom. But with, with the class sizes where they're at, that won't be necessary. For okay. All right. I got it now. Good okay. question. Uh, and the only other question um, uh, that stuck out to me um, related to the technology, the iReady, I mean, we, I think, and, and maybe Mr. McNally and Mr. McCabe can weigh on in this, on this as well. I think that um, we made the decision to purchase that based on the experience that we had during the remote learning in the last three months of the year. Um, would we have necessarily purchased that if we hadn't had that experience or maybe Dr. Pearson even? Yeah, so um, we actually were using iReady in our MTSS uh, process in several schools across the district prior to March. Um, they had been using it all year um, and they had actually been asking to purchase it from as early as January. The, the teachers who were using it to support interventions really felt like it was a strong tool and could be helpful for classroom teachers. Um, the remote learning scenario just amplified um, the need for a tool uh, that had the similar um, assessment and instructional um, component aligned. Um, and so uh, we, we coded it here, but you very well could have seen a recommendation in the spring to purchase it and replace performance series with our previous assessment that we used for uh, formative assessments at the elementary level. Um, it, it was quite probable that we would have recommended to purchase it anyway. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, unless there's any other questions, we'll move on. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I guess I would just clarify, I mean, this is something we'll continue to track. Um, I, I would just ask, is, is this something you'd like to see on a, on a quarterly basis, or, or would you like to see it at a different interval than that? Um, I guess my thought is, um, I, I would, I think we would like to, or I would like to see it monthly, um, probably at least for like the, the next 90 days, and then we can kind of reassess. And if things have, have settled, um, then maybe there won't be as, as need, much of a need. Um, I don't know, Mr. McNally, Mrs. McCabe, do you have any other thoughts or is that okay? I, you're, are you talking specifically about iReady? No, about the entire, um, this document that lays out how we've been funding COVID expenses. Well, I, I think that obviously we're going to, we're going to kind of want to be able to track that just so that we know um, what's going on. As you say, the next 90 days are probably most critical. Yeah. Uh, so that we know what's going on. I, I think it's, it's probably, I don't know how in depth we have to get, um, but it's, it's probably a good idea for us to have an idea of, of how we're going against that, you know, that amount of money we have set aside for that. Okay. Mrs. Fergrieve, it's, it's Mr. Mannheim. I, I agree too. Um, I think that's, this is probably a good thing for us to hear every month. You know, it's kind of a high level, you know, impact where we are. And like Mr. McNally said, you know, things are going to kind of be changing for the next, you know, few months for sure. So I think it's a good thing for us to hear it every, every month. Okay, thank you for that input. Mm -hmm. And I guess the only other thought I, I would have, Dr. Chapman, is um, maybe we also want to add how this is booking out against our contingency um, that we talked about once our, our budget is, is you know, approved and, and all of that stuff. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much. This all was right. very good. Great. Thank you. Okay, and then um, with that, we move to item D, which is reviewing our final draft of the D303 fiscal year 2021 budget. Yes, and so I'm going to um, share my screen if I'm able, I'm trying to figure out how to do that here. Here it is. Um, 
and will present. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks. It's my pleasure to talk to you tonight about the fiscal year 2020-21 budget draft two. Um, as we do every year, it's always good to start with talking about the board accomplishments and how this budget supports uh, student growth and, and the instructional initiatives. You know, without focus on that, the, the budget really is, is quite meaningless. Um, you, know, you as a board um, ask, ask us to uh, stay consistent with our five-year financial forecast, and we look at our financial profile score as a, as a key indicator. And the financial profile score, as you know, as a board, is the state's um, strongest measure to fiscal health uh, that we have. And, and the district has maintained a perfect 4.0 rating uh, for the past several years. Um, also, um, a feather in the district's cap is, is the, the low leverage uh, that the district has in terms of debt related to the, your overall budget, or the lowest in the state. Um, and from a county perspective, District 303 has the lowest school district debt tax rate in the county. So no one in the county has a lower proportion of their tax rate associated to the debt issued than, than the district does. Um, the debt service will uh, drop again um, in a couple years. It's, it's, uh, we'll go over that shortly, but uh, not only is the debt low, it's dropping. Um, so from, from an objectives perspective, uh, we, we as a district support the, the board's goal in, in a, attaining above average achievement for its students at average costs or below. Uh, this is a balanced budget. Um, I'm proud to say that it's a very flexible and agile budget, budget as we look to support um, remote learning and different models of, and modes of uh, instructional uh, initiatives that will come through the year. Um, a heavy uh, dose of reductions in our operational expenditures to protect those instructional initiatives that are going on um, as we start the fiscal year, as a school year, excuse me. Um, and then of course, always paying attention to our, our tax rate and, and trying to keep taxes as low as possible for our stakeholders. So typically, um, you know, this year started much like it has in the past where about nine months ago, you know, we, we jumped off with our tax levy and, and looked at our five-year projections and things were looking kind of normal, so to speak. And then in March, of course, COVID-19 uh, reared its ugly head and, and really threw a wrench into uh, what we thought was going to be a fairly um, typical process. Um, since then, we've, we've worked towards, as you might recall, back in April, a forecast of around $4.75 million of lost revenue that we had to overcome. Um, and, and as we presented to you uh, back in, in May, uh, a balanced budget and we've continued to refine and improve that uh, budget as we go through. So uh, we're nearing the end of that process uh, today with draft two. And um, as we come through, you can see the schedule on the screen. Um, really the next step would be for you as a board at the August 10th meeting to establish a public hearing. Uh, the next day we would publish that budget hearing notice which would allow for a 30 day window before approval um, at the September 14th meeting. So we would hold a public hearing um, which is not required, by the way, because we are not exceeding uh, the, the state threshold for taxes, but we historically have always done that uh, for transparency purposes, and then we'd ask you as a board to adopt the budget. So I showed this slide back in draft one. I think it's still relevant as we look back in time, back to the Great Recession in 2007. You know, one thing that this board has continued to do over the long term is to have balanced budgets and to protect fund balance uh, for a couple of reasons. One, fund balance is there to be efficient with um, the community's dollars. Um, issuing tax anticipation warrants is extremely expensive and costly. And if we don't have sufficient fund balance to uh, ride out the low periods of the time in the budget cycle, then uh, that is necessary. Some of the area districts are in the position where they have to do that, uh, which is, is again inefficient. And then secondly, at a time like this, um, knowing that as a board, we can rely on our budget, uh, even with a shortfall of up to six months of, of no revenue, um, is certainly a, a, a reassurance that, that the needs of the, the district are gonna be met throughout the fiscal year, that we won't have to worry about being payroll or paying vendors uh, in a timely manner. 
Um, I know that at the l and meeting on Monday night, we had a discussion about board goals on fund balance. So there'll be some future discussion on this topic, uh, I believe in the November, December timeframe. Uh, we as a district uh, among our peers are kind of right in the middle in terms of where our fund balance lies compared to those peers. Um, it's again at a, at a spot where we're able to help have a reserve to weather the storm, but certainly we are above the targeted 28, 34% range. And, and you as a board will have an opportunity to, to weigh in on what those priorities might be to help bring that reserve down into either the range that is approved in your policy or into a new range uh, if you should so desire to change that in the future. So this chart just gives you a breakdown of our, our revenues for the 2020-21 year. And this is just looking at, oh, pardon me, uh, at our operating budget. Um, what you'll really notice is um, the, the decrease in revenue came slightly from our state, but mostly from other local. And that other local portion primarily is made up of a uh, reduction in interest income. As you know, rates have fallen substantially. Uh, so we've got a large decrease of around 65% decrease in interest income compared to prior year, as well as school fees, um, a reduction in those fees as well. Uh, all day kindergarten, for example, when we, when we made the shift to, to just offer half day kindergarten, um, you know, that was roughly a million dollars in fees that, that was generated through the all day kindergarten program. Um, we weren't able, we weren't cutting staff because those staff are necessary to support the smaller class sizes um, at our elevator entry level, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, also good to look back at history when we talk about consumer price index. The consumer price index is the most important indicator when it comes to the largest share of our revenue, uh, which is our tax levy. Um, you can see back to the, the Great Recession. Again, we went from that 4.1%, which uh, we haven't seen a, a CPI that high in a long, long time, uh, but the nosedive really coming into the Great Recession of a 0.1%. Um, but what's also important to note is that that did rebound fairly quickly um, coming out of the Great Recession. Will it in the future? You know, that's we're not so sure if that's the case. But uh, we have been hovering the last four years around a two percent plus or minus a couple uh, decimal points there, and um, we certainly are are not forecasting anywhere near two percent as we come into the next uh, consumer price index, which will be recorded in January of 2021. Um, but I think when we look long term. Um, you know, we're, we've, we've adjusted those assumptions down, but, but um, also don't want to overreact the other way. So again, talking about consumer price index, it can get a little confusing sometimes when we look at CPI and we talk about which budget year does it impact. Um, we, we have knowns and unknowns as we work through the budget process. And in 2019 levy, which is reported in January of 2020, um, the current, the most recent CPI is 2.3%. And that makes up half of our uh, revenue for the budget that you will, will be looking for your approval on in September. The other half of that is unknown, and we won't know that until well after the budget process is done. So the CPI that comes out on January 21, which will be the year end of 2020 levy, um, we have to forecast. So uh, that assumption has been made, and, and that's where we get to an estimate of $162.4 million in total levy revenue. Um, that we have. So um, CPI certainly is a risk factor. Um, it's more of a long-term risk factor as those interest, uh, the, the increases are compounding year over year. So while there's some risk in terms of approving the budget as there is every year, um, you as a board have uh, at least the assurance that that's a one-year uh, commitment on that. And then secondly, you'll always maintain the, uh, the right and ability to uh, amend your budget should we see something that's significantly uh, off from our projections. So I think this scenario is worth noting. Again, we talked about this at the draft one budget, but really just to, to remind you as a board, one of the benefits of, of the negotiations with the teachers union two years ago uh, was being able to tie the largest expenditure category that we have to the largest revenue category we have. And so why is that important is if we look at the example of a 1% drop, so if we projected, for example, 2% for um, our, our levy increase for CPI, and it comes in at 1%, that's going to be a $1.6 million uh, hit or reduction in revenue that we're going to receive off of the budget. And in the past, when, when this, the teacher's contract was not tied to CPI, that expense category um, would not fluctuate. We were fixed into that level. 
Now our CPI is part of the equation. And so if we see a 1% reduction on, on that CPI, we're also going to see a 1% reduction uh, in the SCA salaries, which is roughly, in this particular example, $800,000. So effectively what's happened is you, you've kind of hedged that risk uh, down from a $1.6 million risk to, a, to an $800,000 risk. And so um, all of us are kind of in this together, so to speak, when the economy does well, uh, the district does well and, and, and gets more revenue and, and, and the teachers are able to, to pick up um, larger raises as well. So I've talked a lot about consumer price index, but just so you know, this is kind of where we've uh, fallen in. We've adjusted it down to 1% assumption for, for next year. And then moving forward, um, gone down from that 2% that I referenced earlier down to 1.5% to be uh, a little bit more conservative in our future projections. So overall, our key drivers, um, I've, I've talked a lot about that on the, on the local side, but I would also talk about the state revenue. Um, thankfully, the evidence-based model from draft one, you might recall, we were projecting a $9 million total, which was less than base level funding. Uh, we're now up to, to um, to a $9.6 million uh, base level funding amount, which is good. That, that came out right after draft one came out. So um, that's a good thing. But if the, if the for some reason, the state board was ever to prorate, you can see the figures there that we would um, adjust on a per pupil basis. Also, I would look at the categorical payments. And as I mentioned earlier uh, to Mr. McNally's question, you know, categorical payments, we receive around $1.3 million uh, every quarter. Um, those are, likely to see some delays as the state struggles. That's typically the area that they, they will delay payments on. We usually get them, but it's, it's oftentimes late. So um, just to give you an idea of what that might mean from a scale perspective, it's about 1.3 million every, every quarter. Um, so in this budget, uh, we talked about state, state funding already, except for, uh, I would just mention that on the categorical side, we are assuming two categorical payments um, one from the current year and one from the prior year um, for those two totals. Um, Medicaid is, is something that likely will take a hit because less services have been provided and, and the revenue stream um, will probably see delays there as well. So we put in a reduction of 20%, um, a 10% reduction in the corporate personal property replacement tax, uh, which is directly from uh, the, the revenue from the state. Uh, that's that's calculated, and then we have not made any changes on school funding or or any kind of uh, uh, property tax freeze. Local funding, I mentioned the the significant drop in interest rates. So we're in draft one. I think I had a forty five percent drop. I've I've actually increased that drop up to sixty five percent reduction based on interest rates, um, and then our fee based revenue down forty five percent. And then on the federal side, um, we do have around $530,000 just short of that actually through uh, the CARES Act monies and all other funding on a federal level has been held flat. Shifting over to our expenditures, um, as is common in most years, salaries and benefits make up uh, the bulk uh, anywhere between 75 and 80% in any given year. And uh, this year we're at 78.9%. The, the increase in share that I've noted on the slide, um, a 2.2% increase in salaries and benefits is really more um, connected to our decrease on the capital outlay. So uh, we've um, eliminated certain projects uh, out of Fund 20 in Mr. Baird's budget. We've also uh, scaled back to, to our bus plan and, and reduced expenditures there. So that's why you see that shift in terms of the allocation of those expenses. Um, you're very well familiar with the key drivers. I'm not going to talk too much about that. I would just touch on health insurance real quickly and just say um, on a percentage basis, health insurance is the, the largest driver of our budget. Uh, we are self-insured and um, I think we've implemented a, a, a fair deal of, uh, of new initiatives and changes to, to our plan design over the years that have helped to keep our, uh, our plan cost effective. Uh, but a 1% change in health insurance is roughly $175,000. So included in the budget from a salary perspective, we, we do have um, bargaining agreements in place with all three of our, our groups. And so that this budget reflects those increases. Um, additionally, our non-bargaining staff, uh, if you look at last year's dollar amount allocated for the staff and this year's, it is held 
constant from the, uh, from the prior year. Health insurance projected at a 5% increase. Um, and then something different out of this draft than you saw in the last draft was uh, we went ahead and removed the $400,000, um, I would call it kind of a hedge against uh, the state that a TRS cost shift. Um, given the economic climate uh, and the lack of discussion at the state level, we feel pretty safe in, in doing that this year. Uh, in future years, we'll probably look to, to bring that back. But for now, I think we can assume that that probably is not going to happen in this budget year. So touching really quickly on the elementary staffing adjustment, this is really the, the largest change. Um, I'm not going to talk about the top half, but you saw in draft one, we had, we had made adjustments and tried to reduce expenditures there. And that was before we uh, went to the in-person uh, model and it announced that. Uh, so in draft two, looking at this, this is assuming that all students come in person. And we know some will. We know that some will come through uh, remote learning. Um, but as part of that process, as I mentioned earlier, we do need to eliminate um, all day kindergarten staff to, to help uh, lower the class size, accomplish social distancing. Uh, additionally, there are, are specialist positions within our district that uh, that have been uh, that have appropriate licensure to be teachers, and, and we've gone ahead and made the assumption that, that will happen. And then, um, even with that, we still are going to require additional staff, and so. Again, this is assuming that all students come in person. We're going to be very conservative on the budget side here, and that would necessitate 10 additional FTE. But if, for example, just as an illustration, if 10% of our students selected um, remote learning, it may lower the need to increase to six FTE. And I have the word may bolded and underlined because the, the importance of that is it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to flow evenly throughout all of our grade levels. So uh, that number could be much lower, which again is why we're, we're being conservative in the budget, assuming the 10th half need. Um, we talked about in draft one, some, some labor reductions uh, on a custodial side. We pulled forward a lot of our cleaning and we're able to reduce our GSF contract for July by about $75,000. Uh, we also delayed some of the transitioning of our 10 and 12 month positions. Uh, which provided some cost savings and um, for operations maintenance and our technology staff, uh, we reduced our part-time summer staff as well to help reduce the start of the fiscal year spending. I won't talk about this too much. We talked about this before, but there are many areas where we made reductions from and different funds. Uh, um, I would say the one thing that's not uh, highlighted here that is a change from draft one to draft two is um, further reductions in our uh, utility spending. We continue to be at historic lows in terms of natural gas spending, uh, which is is really uh, you know been a been a huge benefit for the district, and we continue to see that we're able to actually store and supply. Uh, I believe as of next month, we'll have 75% of our necessary natural gas stored for the year. So we've actually locked in that savings uh, and feel confident in those numbers moving forward. So contingency funding, this is something new to the budget this year um, that we haven't done in the past. And the state code has always allowed for us to budget a contingency amount, uh, which we're recommending we do this year. We have a million dollars um, on the expenditure side located in the 6,000 function code. And there's offsetting revenue on the revenue side in the same amount. So there's no net impact in terms of the, the budget uh, totals. Um, and that's done because we may get grants available. Uh, we certainly have applied for certain things through FEMA and things like that. There could be another round of stimulus uh, grants that are provided. Uh, we really just don't know at this point. So we don't want to show something artificial in terms of the budget with that contingency. Um, so what will the contingency be used for? Um, and what does it allow you to, to do? Um, you can see some of the things up on the screen or in your packet um, that we could potentially use those for. Um, the way this works from mechanically from the budget perspective is uh, it prevents us from being forced to do an amended budget. And you as a district are able to do run over at the function code level by only 10%. If you go over any uh, function code by more than 10%, you're required to do an amended budget. Um, in this particular case, if we do place money in the contingency funding, um, you wouldn't have to amend your budget. You would just authorize transfers being made into the appropriate line items. So it's just a little more flexibility in the budget process. Looking at our bond schedule, uh, we've talked about this for the past several years, um, and it's good to look back at how, uh, how significantly that drop was from the 2016 to 17 levy 
around $16 million when North High School was paid off. Uh, we've stabilized into right around the four and a half to $5 million range of late. And then um, not next year, but the following year is when we'll see uh, a, a drop off uh, around 50% of the debt uh, retired uh, once again. So the net operating surplus uh, for draft two, which we hope to be uh, our final budget, will be 535,466. This is um, an improvement of just over uh, $300,000 from draft one, we're at $192,000. So that uh, puts us in a very strong position. Overall, uh, there is a all funds deficit, um, largely that's covering our capital expenditures and fund 60, as you can see there on the screen, uh, $770,000. We still have additional payments to make um, as we close out the Haynes project, for example. Um, and then I, I think I mentioned this as well in the memo. Um, we did um, make a, a shift from our five-year capital expenditures being uh, placed in fund 20 over to fund 60. And so um, that shift actually will help us in terms of uh, keeping our operating budget lower and also uh, complies with uh, the preferences of our auditors. So this chart you've seen for years, and again, what we really look for is, is over the, the, the short term, the next two years kind of flat um, on, on both the red and the purple lines. The purple line, the lower line is really important because that's where we have to worry about tax anticipation warrants if, if on the low end of our fund balance, we get too low. Um, I've included in there our fund balance target of 28 to 34 percent in the green, which, uh, as you can see, we we have uh, room uh, to come down from. Um, I, I tend to remind people not to worry too much about the last couple of years because there's assumptions embedded in our five-year projection that we know that we'll be adjusting and doesn't account for retirees and things of that nature. So uh, that that drop off in that last year too really is uh, typically overstated. So uh, wrapping up our next steps, um, we just really need to confirm uh, with you that this draft two budget reflects uh, the goals and the desires of you as a board. If there are any adjustments that need to be made, we do have time over the next week to, to make those adjustments. Um, on August 10th at the board meeting, you would be establishing a public hearing. Uh, we'd be placing the tentative budget on display and then we'd be looking for your approval on September 14th. At this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, Dr. Chapman, I have a few questions. Um, when you, uh, on one of the pages, you spoke to, you spoke about um, incoming revenue stream from the CARES Act via title funds, approximately 530,000. Is that in addition to what you've already identified on the COVID-19 impact because it's coming in through title funds or is that one and the same? No, it, it is the same. And yeah, the, the, the CARES Act, um, the way the mechanism that they funded the CARES Act was to utilize the same model or formula that the title funds would use. So sorry if that was confusing. No, that's okay. Um, and then uh, the other question I had was when we talked about where we made some reductions, um, specifically around furniture and equipment. I think, uh, I just wanted to confirm, we are still, as we're preparing for school to open and so forth, we're ensuring that, you know, wherever the students are gonna be, that we have chairs that are in working order and, and all of our furniture is up to, up to standard. Yes, absolutely, yeah, and, and Mr. Baird has, um, he, he has a budget for furniture and equipment that is special to the district level and that he can allocate replacement plans and things of that nature. And then there's other furniture and equipment at the school level um, that continues to be purchased as they need to. So there, there's kind of two different line items there. And the one where we really looked at the reductions was in the district level accounts. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from Mrs. McCabe or Mr. McNally or Mr. Mannheim? Um, Again, Dr. Chapman, thank you. Um, I'm breathing a little easier. Um, it, I, you know, it's just fascinating to see how previous boards did such a great job so that when we come to a crisis like this, we're able to do some things that other districts can't do. 
Um, so my thanks to administration and previous boards for the the stewardship that they did, because I think our community is going to, our kids are going to benefit from it. Now I'm going to ask a question that may be stupid. I know there's no stupid question, but so what do we put in the contingency? How much money is do we allocate for that? Um, is that is that a percentage of, of the budget, or I've I've never dealt with a contingency in a budget. So what's your recommendation or what is the law say? Yeah, there's there's no set formula or way to do it. And I think Dr. Pearson talked a little bit about this on, on Monday night. You know, we're, you know, you, you've seen kind of what we spent so far um, and it's it's netting out to around a million dollars. And so quite frankly, that was, that was the reason we selected putting a million dollars uh, in the budget right now in the contingency. Um, I think there will be reductions in expenses if certain things happen related to COVID-19, um, but there also likely will be, you know, increasing costs as well. So um, it, it is an educated guess at this point as to what number we put in there. And uh, if there's a number that you as a board think is, is a better number to use, we're certainly open to that. When we saw what the COVID expenses were and a huge chunk of it were toilets and faucets you know, which will benefit us for years to come. It's not, you know, um, it's fascinating because luckily we have the money to be able to look to adding teachers, which is where we really want our money to go. But then you have those other expenses that have to be used to keep our kids safe. So um, again, thank you for, for putting this together and, and to everybody for the work they've done to keep our district going strong. Thank you. Mr. McNally, do you have something? No, I just, um, you know, I, the, the, my main question I think was at, answered, which is, you know, all those that I know that the, the yearly, what comes from the state and I, I just had that concern. Um, I'm gonna echo the sentiment that, that Mrs. McCabe had, had indicated that it, we've done a, uh, well, I shouldn't say we, you guys have done a great job and we've, we've done a great job of, of giving you a check mark for it, of uh, getting that stuff done and, and making sure that we're in strong financial situation. And I do hope that, um, that, that the people watching this understand the amount of work that goes into what you've done. Thank you. It's, it's has been a, a very big team effort and uh, just to give a little credit to Mr. Baird and Mr. Smith, especially because a lot of the reductions came out of their budgets and because they were able to plan ahead, um, it put us in a really good spot. So, um, The one final question that I thought of, so um, our next board meeting, I believe will be uh, right before we're reopening school. So by that time, will you be able to give us um, a better um, look simply because of timing? related to the staffing and some of those expenses like you had talked about the 10 versus six and things like that, those impacts? So um, because of the need to get the packet put together and get this posted, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if we'll get an answer to that as well. I, I, I think we could make an adjustment. Um, likely at this time, um, if, if things continue to go the direction we, we have, I think that we're probably better off staying kind of where we're at with a more conservative number. Mm -hmm. um, because we're in an operating surplus, I think we will make up that deficit uh, during the year for the total budget anyway. Um, certainly if, if you as a board want us to strive to get to that, we could, but I don't know that there's enough there in that staffing to get us to an all funds um, balance anyway. But you know, typically in a given year, we, we, we will cover that that gap. So um, I guess our, our recommendation at this point is probably to stay with this budget. Uh, but if, if you'd like us to, to fine tune it as we get closer, it's certainly something we could do. I, I, th I think fair enough. Let me let me ask it this way. Um, putting what the actual budget states aside, will you be able to give us an update in terms of how what our actual expense, like in that category, for example, is going to look like? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so 
I'll work with Ms. Geyer and Mr. Moore and we'll, we'll make sure that we can give you a better idea of what actual looks like. Okay, thank you. I, I, on that same note, I assume we'll get a percentage of students who chose to do remote versus face-to-face. -face. Dr. Pearson, are, are you planning yeah. to give us an update on that? So, so we're still tracking about the same place where we were on Monday. It's about 15% um, are choosing remote. Um, we, we're seeing it tick up just a little bit, you know, about a percentage over what was happening Monday, but it's continuing to trend about 15% are choosing. Okay. And that's, that's across the whole district, not high school, middle, you'll, you can give us that when you get a final number. So the, I, the only final commentary I have, at least on this, is I, I know I had mentioned the other day that uh, I I was wondering if if the uh, I think it was one million we set aside was was going to be adequate, and it sounds like you're recommending we stick with that as a more conservative approach because we really have the surplus elsewhere anyway if we need. Is that kind of an accurate restatement? Yes. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. All right, then I'm happy with it. If you are. I Okay, thank you, Dr. Chapman, um, for that overview. So with that, we'll move on to item E, which is a review of the final draft for the Mid Valley Special Education Budget. Yeah, I'll, I'll cover this uh, briefly. You know, you, we had a, a draft one uh, presentation as well um, in your packet on page 49 is a memo uh, that Ms. Sporer put together uh, providing any update. Um, Remarkably, they're trending almost exactly the same total number of students as they were a year ago. Um, similar to D303, they've made significant reductions in their operations and maintenance budget down 21% uh, uh, with a total increase uh, in their education fund of 2.57%. Um, I'm not gonna go through the details of, the, of their budget. Um, I know they've, they've gone through a very similar process as, as we go through. Um, as their fiscal agent, we, um, they state our kind of timeline in terms of approvals. So we'd be asking you know, you to put theirs, uh, their budget on public display as well. Uh, we go through the same process uh, at the August and September meetings we, and we, we do a public hearing uh, and approval uh, for their budget as well. So, um, and, and by the way, I, I failed to mention this earlier, I would, do, I would do a presentation during the public hearing of our budget. And then at that time, we'd also do a brief one on the balance. Can I ask a, a question, Dr. Pearson, how does Mid Valley do their plan with, is it seven districts that they cover? Do Mid Valley actually has five member districts. Um, so it's Batavia, Geneva, St. Charles, Caneland and Burlington Central um, are the five member districts of Mid Valley. And then sometimes we accept students from other places if we, in, in certain programs, but they're not member districts and they pay a higher rate of tuition. Um, and basically, you know, the revenue side of Mid Valley budget is, is billed back to school districts because we, they, don't, they don't have property tax or those kinds of things. Whatever expense they occur, incur, we're paying our portion of those expenses um, through, a, through a billing process. I guess I was looking to how are they going to re reopen? Yeah. So, you know, many of those students and families are in specialized programs. And so um, throughout the course of the summer, the Mid Valley um, staff has been contacting families and talking about what it looks like um, as they're coming back to school. Um, as you know, many of our special education programs already have lower class sizes. Um, by state requirement. Uh, most of them are capped at 13 and many of them have fewer than that depending on the programming and, and what's necessary. So <clears throat> for, for many of those programs, they're able to accomplish um, the social distancing that's necessary. Um, but it's, it's a family by family, student by student discussion that they're having. Um, and they've been working on it for quite some time now because um, they also have students that are medically fragile or have other needs. And so they're just trying to make sure that um, they're doing exactly what they need to do for every student. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. So Dr. Chapman, I think we can transition into item F and then item G after that. Yeah. Um, so as I just mentioned before, uh, part of the process is uh, putting the budget on public display. So that's, uh, that's really all 
F is for us and it's what G would be for Mid Valley. Okay. okay, pretty standard practice. So any questions? Okay. Um, so moving on to item H, um, we had agreed at a prior committee meeting that we would be looking for um, uh, a facility master plan update um, on a monthly basis as part of this committee. So I think the plan, Dr. Chapman, is for um, Walden Associates to uh, talk to us for a few minutes. Absolutely, yep. And Mr. Dan Critta is here with us and I'll turn it over to him to give you an update. Thanks, Dr. Chapman. Hello, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Um, thanks for uh, allowing the opportunity to share our progress since the June update. Um, so a couple things are going on right now. We're focusing on the educational alignment study and the capacity study. And we had the opportunity to meet with uh, Dr. Geyer and Dr. Moore last week. And with their input, we're refining that deliverable a little bit now to uh, present that in a draft form on August 4th to the SLT. And I'm sure there'll be some, some more input at that level that we'll keep uh, refining. Um, but that is focusing on the program needs and the capacity of each of the schools. We're also scheduling BLT meetings because for the secondary schools because that process was interrupted at the end of the school year. And uh, so we'll be setting those up just to confirm some of the things we heard at the principal levels and to make sure that uh, those voices are heard at the BLT at, at that group level. And then we'll dovetail that into the report as that information is uh, shared with us. On the facility assessment side, which is fo focusing on the physical deficiencies of the buildings, um, we're having a draft review tomorrow morning with uh, Mr. Baird and uh, Dr. Chapman um, to kind of go through the first flush of all that information. And then we'll also uh, be coordinating what supplement or face information do we need to add to that? What's, what's missing? What, we're, what wasn't on our radar? And then also talk about how we prioritize those items because there's, there's a lot of things in there that don't have an urgency to it, but we wanna see how do we track that out through a capital planning process over five, 10 years and beyond. So we'll get our first kind of inkling from, from the group tomorrow of how to start that prioritization. And then we're targeting that document to be at a, at a final draft level mid-August. So uh, those are the two reports that are going on. Then looking ahead at next steps, um, we mentioned this at the last meeting too, is looking at the, the board's role in this. And you had some questions for me last meeting. Um, we'll be talking to SLT and suggesting some ideas on how to move that forward as far as to get, share with the board. Um, how do you set up guiding principles? How do you set up kind of the ground rules for going into a stakeholder engagement process? Um, so that information will be forthcoming in August. And I think you have a board workshop or a discussion coming up that would probably be a good time to to share that. So those are the kind of next steps going ahead. And one of the things we probably put an emphasis on is just what protocols do we want to look at as we bring in a stakeholder engagement process in the fall, especially in the environment that we're in right now is what makes sense and how big a group and those kind of questions. So that kind of gets you up to speed of where we're at. We were really using July as our as our review month to get in front of uh, different groups in the district and then um, to really put a ribbon around the reports here in August. Questions uh, for me? Thank you for that update. I do have one question. Uh, up to this point in your process, is there anything that you have not been able to do that you would normally have done um, pre COVID-19? Well, we're, we're kind of backtracking and filling that in now. That was the, the BLT meetings at the at the high school. I think they were right in the heart of graduation, and it didn't make sense to try to track that. We did get those through those in a video conference format with the, all the elementary schools, but high schools and secondary schools kind of fell to the, the wayside. So we're going to end up getting that information in just a little more roundabout way. Other than that, I think we were able to, you know, it, we certainly adapted the process a little bit. But I think we were able to um, get what we needed to get. Um, the one thing that, uh, and, and thankfully, uh, Mr. Baird is, is available, but uh, to find out if there's people in the district that are working on his team that might have information on the facility side that we didn't have to interface. We didn't, weren't able to interface. We did a lot of our, our walk into the buildings just looking through our eyes. And many times we like to do that side by side or have a discussion after the fact of, Okay, what, what is it that we couldn't see that you're dealing with? 
So that process will start with uh, John tomorrow and then anybody else he wants to bring into the conversation. So we're, we're catching up on that part of it, but I think everything else went as planned. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm curious. If there's there's an opportunity here that our our educators have had the experience of technology use in a different way, and I'm I'm hopeful that maybe some of the the crisis we've gone through is going to lead us into what the future could look like. Um, I'm wondering if you're seeing any of that in any of your work, not necessarily with us, where educators are beginning to look at buildings differently because of the experience we've gone through. I would say it's just starting. I think there's we're in a little bit of a reaction mode right now of just figuring out how to do it. But I think what's starting to sink in a little bit is the successful portions of that process of distance learning that maybe could are going to stick. And I think, how does that change buildings? How does it uh, change technology plans going forward? So I think we're just on the cusp of it, but it definitely could have an impact. Um, you know, the blended learning program at the high school, um, we've been involved with other programs similar to that, where there's a lot more self-guided component to a student's schedule at that level. And I think you're going to see more of that, which could be triggered by this, but I think it was in the works anyway. I think we had, uh, we're in a, to have this happening at the same time, maybe like hair pulling out at some point, but it's also a chance for us to really talk about what education should look like, having experienced this kind of situation and, and where, what are the best parts of our learning or where can we go? It could all fall into place in a nice way. I'm, I'm hopeful. Absolutely. Yeah. Kind of pick the things that are working and not working and, and rally behind what's positive. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Again, thank you very much um, for your time. We definitely appreciate the update um, and the attention to detail that you gave. So thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Have a great night. Uh, so moving on to the next item, I, um, I'm not sure, Mr. Baird, are you going to speak to that one related to the Belgram playground? I, I... Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we just, uh, in, in partnership with uh, Laura Rudow and the parks, we have a phenomenal relationship with them. Due to COVID and some of the supply demands that were out there after you had approved that at the board level, we went out and so they were having some manufacturing difficulties. And just last month we met with the um, construction company. And as we met with them, they had told us that they would be unable to start the installation till I think he's lost a connection. Late August going to September. Um, and the local law enforcement, because trying to talk about we're going to be able to bring buses in or not bring them in. Uh, there were just safety concerns with kids, when they could work, when they would be ap actually able to do it. And the difference with Bell Graham is we use the back of that school as a bus turnaround. So I have seven buses that go in the back of that. So at the end of the day, uh, Amy Kupel and Jan Geyer, you know, we, we we just had a real good conversation and said this would be something better off if we could do next summer. You, you know, it usually can take weather and everything else just six to eight weeks sometimes on the install. And that's why our intent would have been great to do it in the summer. But at this point, we, we felt it better. Um, and of course, with the board's blessing to be able to, to move it to next summer, put it onto our cap plan for next year and actually go out to rebid because th those playground companies can only hold on to that. But at the end of the day, they could not even confirm uh, the, the calendar for the installation. So we were not comfortable. Okay. Um, I did have a question um, 
to Mr. Bear or, Do or Dr. Pearson and more though from a COVID standpoint, I was interested in, uh, you know, St. Charles Park District has has opened um, their playgrounds. And so I was interested in, in the background on our thought process about why our um, playgrounds at the schools when school is open will not be available. And, and I'm wondering, perhaps that's an immediate approach. And then as we progress, you know, that will open up or what the thinking is there. Yeah, so I mean, in the short term, it's really related to just the cleaning protocols and being able to ensure that the equipment is clean. Um, the park district has their, um, some of their playgrounds open, but they also have sign, signage posted, you know, that it's basically use at your own risk um, kind of situation. And, and uh, we wanna, we would rather start more conservatively and then realize that we can use some of that equipment and open it. So for now, the task force, um, the building health and safety task force um, has recommended that we not use the playgrounds to start the year and then we'll look at whether or not we can put a process in place and begin to open some of those things up or part of the equipment up. Okay all right thank you. Any other questions comments? Okay uh, thank you Mr. Baird for the clarification on that. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the next item item K the G Suite Enterprise Annual Renewal I think, is that, yeah, Mr. Smith. Sorry, did we skip one? Yeah, we skipped one. Oh, yes, we did. I, my apologies. Actually, we'd go to Dr. Chapman um, related to the St. Charles Park District rent relief request with Haynes. Yeah, this, this is a, a bit of a unique situation, obviously, with COVID-19. Um, the Park District reached out uh, to administration um, about a month ago and, and asked about um, potential rent relief due to the fact that um, they were not able to operate. Um, they lost right around $28,000 of projected revenue from the shutdown over that three month period. Um, so they were looking for some rent relief. We still um, incurred expenses, of course, for utilities. Uh, I mentioned earlier that our utility expenses have been um, favorable compared to the past. Um, but typically what we do is whatever that margin of rent that's not um, just utilities is, is covers some cleaning expenses and it also covers um, us to be able to replace equipment. So there's a capital kind of, conting uh, not contingency, but capital uh, outlay piece of that that we, we reserve um, out of our rent payments. Um, so I, I didn't want to categorically say no because we certainly understand and value the partnership with the park district. Um, I think there could potentially be an option for you to, to do something here, um, but I also think that as a district, we should, we should look to cover our costs. So um, our costs, again, for that space are probably um, right around uh, $10,000 for that three-month period, and their rent um, that they would be paying is $3,937 per month. So you're talking about a $2,000 delta over that three-month period. Mr. McNally, do you have comments? I was waiting. I didn't want to jump in. So, Absolutely. Um, Go ahead. No, I, I uh, you know, the one thing that, that really kind of occurs to me is that to a great extent, it's the same pool of people that are paying the money and it's, is it being funneled to the tax, the tax money being funneled to the school district, to the park district, but I'm not in charge of the park district's budget. Um, and so I want to make sure that, that um, we're being responsible with our portion of, of that taxpayer money. Um, and, and it does sound fair to me that, that we collect, uh, you know, some portion of that. Um, you know, obviously they're unable to use it and I can understand that. Um, so they weren't able to tease it for the reasons they wanted to, but um, I, you know, we, in order to cover some of our costs, I, I think it's, it sounds fair to me that we, we would recover some portion of that. Um, our la my last in-person meeting was going to the Haynes little open house we had with the park district where we didn't know what, we didn't know how close to stand to each other. That feels like a lifetime ago. I'm wondering how much of the utility costs would have, we would have incurred anyway um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to help out with the rent. 
um, I think maybe look to see what we really can give that or, you know, forgive or whatever the right term is. $2,000 doesn't sound like very much to me, but um, maybe that is a huge piece of their, that will help them. But if we were gonna have the building operating anyway, whether they were in it or not, um, I don't know, that's where I, I sit right now, but I'm, I'm absolutely willing to look at some rent relief. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mannheim, are you still on the line? Would be interesting. I am, yep, okay. I am. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm in support of this. Yeah, I, I, and I, I'm just to kind of go back to it. I, I agree, like I said, it's, it's essentially the same pool of taxpayers and whatever really, I just want it, whatever's gonna work to make sure that, that budgets are gonna work out for everyone. That's really kind of where I'm at. So, um, you know, we're, we are not talking about a massive portion of our budget here. Um, I just, you know, it's, it's kind of like trying to make sure the till balances at the end of the shift, that's all. Yeah, I would tell you guys just very quickly uh, where I stand. I was supportive of this as well. Um, uh, while appreciating maintaining, you know, at least our cost um, to keep the building running from a utility standpoint, I think it it demonstrates good community partnership um, was my thinking as well. So, Dr. Chapman, I'm thinking next steps then. Um, unless you have today, do you have a recommendation in terms of amount of an amount today or would the next step be you'll create a recommendation and then we would put it on for action at the board meeting? Yeah, I, I think, I, th I feel comfortable in a range. I don't know where Dr. Pearson sits on this, but I, I would say anywhere between, you know, 25 and 50% seems reasonable in terms of rent relief. Um, I, I, I think we could, we could absolutely put a recommendation to you for the board meeting for approval if that if that works for you. Okay. Dr. Um, Pearson, did you have any additional thoughts? No, I, I just, I agree. I mean, the park district is a really great partner with us um, and we have reciprocal benefits in the way that our, our relationship works. We are of course supporting the same community, um, but they do a lot to help us with things that we're doing for our, our students and the community as well. So. Um, I certainly agree that we want to try to be as, um, you know, helpful as we possibly can, given the current circumstances. So I agree with Dr. Chapman. I think we could find a number that makes sense for both parties and bring back a recommendation. Okay. All right. Thank you. So then we'll put that uh, on for action um, for the board meeting. Great. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, and now, uh, Mr. Smith, item K. Uh, the G Suite Enterprise Annual Renewal. Sure. So the G Suites Enterprise is a set of tools that we use for uh, the management, security, and, and extra support uh, for our Google Apps for Education offerings. Uh, we have over 15,000 accounts that we need to manage, and especially the security uh, portion. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of the uptick in phishing the last few years, phishing attacks. And that is one of our most vulnerable areas is, is our, our individual users having to deal with, uh, you know, odd emails or things that could lead to fraud. Um, and so this suite of applications gives us many security tools to identify and mitigate uh, many of those risks. Any questions for Mr. Smith? Okay. Um, I am... Uh comfortable putting this on consent unless anyone has a concern. Okay. Okay. So that item will go for consent. And then I think you're also um, discussing or presenting the next item L classroom audio amplification systems. Sure. So this item we actually placed on the agenda as uh, an in case, uh, but the, we went ahead with a, a much smaller purchase than originally anticipated. We are, have ordered 10 systems and it was well under the 10K thresholds, but if they become a high demand item, we may come back with this. And I, I just wanna to speak to this for a minute. These are individual amplification systems for classrooms, for educators that are working with students. Um, it, we may find ourselves in a situation with requiring staff members to wear masks. 
um, that it's hard to hear um, what's being said. And, you know, often, whether we realize it or not, we have students that actually read lips as part of their hearing processing. Um, they, have, they have to be able to see what they're hearing as well. So if it's already hard to hear and also hard to see, uh, the person that's speaking, uh, we may find ourselves in situations where we need to have some of these systems available. So we've ordered some to have on hand. And then we, if we see that number expand or additional people requesting that, that um, uh, system, then we'll of course come back and, and ask you to help us purchase some more. Um, there are school districts that outfit the entire school district, every single classroom in the district with these kinds of systems. We don't have that in place in our district. We have just typically done on an as needed basis. And, and so we just wanna be prepared for what the need might be. How do you know if you need it or not? Is it, a, is it the teacher asking the student or the student complaining or the parent advocating? Do you have a way of finding out, especially with what we're going into? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's variable, right? It depends on um, the timbre of the teacher's voice. Like, you know, some people have big voices and it carries and you can hear and other people don't. So that's part of it. Um, and then also sometimes we are aware of individual student needs that, that um, for auditory processing needs some additional support. Um, so I, I just, we wanted to be prepared because we know that adding this mask component is going to um, cause some issues for some students and some staff, and we want to have some things available to help mitigate any of those concerns that may occur. I'm glad you you've thought about that. I think that'll be really helpful. Thank you. Um, so, oh, go ahead, Mr. Allen. Go ahead. As a little bit of an aside, that's something that kind of I, I was wondering about with um, with regard to the masks. Kind of, sort of unrelated to this topic, but. Um, with regard to masks and, and you were talking about students, it kind of made me think about this, students need, doing some re lip reading. Um, what about younger, like the, the, the early childhood kids, kindergarten, first grade, where they're learning how to read and they, they're gonna need to see how sounds are made and things like that. Are we doing anything with clear masks or anything like that? Yeah, so we have ordered clear mask for staff members. Um, but fortunately for some of the that um, phonemic awareness and some of the sound processing, um, you know, we do have technology based tools that will model that um, for students, um, both audit with auditory support as well as visual support. So um, we have some other tools that we can use, but we have ordered some clear masks um, for people that need that and want to use that to help um, with that as well. I assumed we had addressed it. I just, I didn't know how, and it, when you said that, it, it, it triggered the question in my mind again. So thank you. Um, Dr. Pearson, I, I had a couple um, questions. So um, kind of a, a carry off from Mrs. McCabe's comments. So how will the teachers know that this is a resource that's available that they can ask for? That'll be communicated through the principals or how, how will they know it's available? Yeah, that's exactly right. We're going to let people know that it's available and that it's a tool that we can order for them. Um, Matt, what's the unit cost? They're about a thousand dollars a piece. Just right? about a thousand dollars a piece, correct? Yeah. So um, you know, we we don't want to order more than we need, but we want to provide the ones to to people that need them. So um, that's why we went ahead and ordered some right away, so that we could have some that they could see and then decide whether or not it helped, um, you know, or is necessary in their class. And then what's the turnaround time to, if, if we have 20 teachers that would like one, how quickly can we fulfill that request? We have a vendor who has them in stock in the area. Okay, perfect. Okay. So the turnaround then is, is realistically, I mean, it, as little as a couple days? Quite possibly, yes. Okay, excellent. Okay. Um, great, thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments on this one? Okay, uh, the next item then would be item M, uh, discussion around purchase of room dividers. Um, is that Mr. Baird? Yeah, yeah, so I just wanted to, to share that we are looking at uh, doing some of the dividers with uh, the plexiglass dividers. We have already purchased underneath the $10,000 threshold. We've already purchased about $9,000 worth for our front um, entryways, our front offices uh, for separations, you know, up on top of the high boys for the secretaries. 
Uh, we, there's a lot of people who saw these right now, and we've been blessed with having a parent that uh, was in, within the district that is actually his warehouse is located in Sycamore, and he reduced the price by 33%. So we have that order in place. That being said, as far as the, the dividers, we do, um, we have put uh, out as far as separations for classrooms and different areas that may need them. At this point, we're just taking a tally. We don't know exactly the number. We should have that number by tomorrow for the dividers that might be needed for LRCs, but we have used other furniture and other separations at this time. So it still will probably at this point be under $10,000 for those dividers, okay? So I just wanted to be make you aware of it in case it does go over. Like I said, I'll have a, the number that we'll need to purchase, but that will, you know, we'll make that purchase probably sometime next week, but it could be over 10,000 at this time. I'm not seeing the numbers reflect that. We definitely appreciate the heads up on that. Uh, any, any questions from board members? Well, and I just want to talk procedurally, you know, because of the timing that we're facing right now with the start of school, um, for, if we find ourselves in a situation where we need some of this equipment, we are going to, I'm just going to approve it as an emergency expenditure. Of course, we'll notify you and then we'll bring it to you for approval at the, the next board meeting. Thank, thank you for that clarification, Dr. Pearson. And, and um, you know, speaking for myself, I would expect you to do that. So, but thank you for providing that clarification. And my assumption is this would go in that uh, COVID uh, contingency anyway, right? Oh, right. Yes. We do have greater flexibility. You have greater flexibility with that contingency fund, I'm assuming. Um, and as, as well, you should, so. Okay. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Baird, for that update. Uh, with that said, moving to uh, future agenda items. Um, the only item that I had, and, and Dr. Chapman uh, mentioned it briefly when we went over the final draft of the budget, but I just wanted to um, remind the board that we did agree at Monday Nights Learning and Teaching that in the November, December timeframe for business services that we would be revisiting our policy uh, guidance related to the fund balance. So we will be discussing that and, and making assessments regarding that at the time. And then the next step after that in probably the January, February timeframe would be to determine um, what action we need to take with the fund balance, if any, based on that prior discussion. So just wanted to recap that uh, and then uh, ask the rest of the, the um, board members, are there any future agenda items that you would like to see? Okay. Okay, with that said then, um, it is 6.54 p.m. and the committee meeting is adjourned. Hey, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.